Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good, morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Happy Father's Day. Amen. 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 Happy Father's Day. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. It's Father's Day. And so, Lord, we thank you, especially Jesus. We thank you that you loved your Father. And you still love your Father. And you sit at the right hand of your Father, which is a picture to us, Lord, of how we need fathers. How we're so desirous of the input of a Father in our lives. And so we pray for the fathers in this room this morning. We pray, Father, that you would lift them up. That we would have the Father's heart to this generation and I pray that you will baptize each and every one of us. We don't have to be a male to get, get this kind of baptism. Where you baptize us with the Father's heart. So that we can reach out to another generation, a new generation. Of people round about us, Father. We just thank you. That's the theme of today. And we, we thank you, Lord, for laying that on our heart. We believe it's a new day. It is an absolutely new day. And Lord, so today we're praying over Father's over men of God in their house and in their family and in the workplace, in the marketplace, Lord. We're praying for a new day, a new beginning in the life of fathers and in fatherhood in general. Lord, we just pray right now that you will restore fathers to their families, restore fathers to the church. Lord, in the name of Jesus, restore. We need the fathers, Lord. And I'm asking you to bring them forth in Jesus' name, I thank you and I give you glory, Father. Lord, that you are our Heavenly Father. And that, Lord, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, in whom there is no shadow of turning. We have a Father, whom in there is no shadow. Lord, I thank you. You are the example. You are the one we follow. And you are the one that we live through. In you we live and move and have our being. And so we thank you today. In your mighty, holy, precious name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Get your glasses on and get your Bibles out. I, didn't, I purposely didn't put it up here because I want you to see it in your Bibles. It's in Malachi uh, chapter 4. And it was actually up on the screen for just a minute there in the video. But I really feel it's important that we... Uh, uh, God just gave me a word... Of, uh, while I was singing that, uh, that our God is a foundation. Amen? He's a foundation in our life. Being a father, he would be a foundation. Amen? And so I want you to go to Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, if you would with me. Malachi was a prophet, so he was prophesying about our day and age. And the reason I know that is because of verse 5. The reason I know, he used the word Elijah. And any time you read the word Elijah, that's the days we're living. We're living in a period of time similar to the days of Elijah. As a matter of fact, they're almost cookie cutter, except maybe we wear different clothes today. And maybe have different hairstyles and look a little different. But anyway, uh, it says this, and I want to read this right up front this morning. Uh, talking about Father's and Father's Day and God bringing up raising up a new breed of fathers today. I really believe God's going to do that. He says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And by the way, it's only dreadful to those who don't know him. To those who know him, it's, it's a glorious day. Amen? Uh, verse 6. This is what he's going to do. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Amen. And to understand the day we live in, we almost have to read this backwards. Right now, there's there are so many uh, young men, especially living under a generational curse, that need to be brought up out of it. Amen. They need to be brought up out of it. They've been taught things that they shouldn't have been taught. And they haven't received the love of a father. Some of them haven't received the love of a mother. And so there's this generational thing going on. There's alcoholism. There's drug addiction. There's uh, perversion. All kinds of things that we've greed. Uh, all kinds of things going on today. So if you read this backwards, you see 
that right now we there's there's great generational curses on on families today. But it comes when it comes to the father, he breaks those curses. Amen. Amen. He lives for God and he breaks those curses. Glory to his name. So that the hearts are the children of, are restored to the fathers and the hearts of the fathers, of course, return or uh, brought back to the children. Amen? So what I want to talk to you this morning about with that prophecy in mind as our foundation is the, God beginning, especially today, to raise up a new generations, a generation of fathers. If we're ever going to see a revival take place, if we're ever going to see a great awakening take place, the Father is going to have to be restored. Are you with me? Amen. Susan and I were students at the Brownsville Revival for years. And when we lived in Florida, a, a mighty revival like this day and age has not seen. And uh, it was awesome to be a, a, just a small part of that and be able to uh, experience it. But that revival started, guess what day that revival started? Father's Day. Father's Day. Father's Day. Which happens to usually follow Pentecost, which is really interesting. I never put those two together, but that, uh, that speaks volumes to me. Anyway, uh, that revival started on Father's Day, and it raised up spiritual fathers. So today, I will be morphing back and forth between earthly fathers and, of course, spiritual fathers, whom God is going to raise up. If God is a father, which he is, doesn't it make sense that he's going to raise up spiritual fathers? Amen. Hallelujah. So he's going to have fathers in the family that are going to be strong, and he's also going to have fathers in the church that are going to be strong. Amen. And as God gives me grace to get through what I'm going to get through, I'll show you some men that actually displayed uh, that, and the Apostle Paul actually backed them up and sent them into churches. Amen? It's very, very important. So... This is kind of the run-up to what I want to talk about, about Paul and Timothy and Epaphrodites, who were great men of God, and they were great fathers. They were great fathers not only to their families, but they were great fathers to the church. And we need fathers like that today. Amen? We can't just say, well, the Apostle Paul, we got the Word of God. Yes, we do. And thank God we have the Word of God. But we need to have men of God to, to walk that out and to show our young people. One of the slides up in that video was that he, he didn't learn from what his father said. He learned from what his father did. Amen? Amen. And so Amen. that's how kids learn. And so when I'm talking about a father today, I'm not... Th this is awesome because to be this kind of father I'm talking about, you don't have to have kids. Isn't that nice? Now, now if you have kids, don't send them back, okay? <laughs> All right? Don't do that. All right? But... Because you're, you're responsible for them. But this is not not limited uh, to families. And this morning, I just thank God that, uh, again, I want to say that I had a, a... My father passed away on the uh, January, the what was it, the 4th or the 6th? 4th, anyway. Well, one of those days. Uh, I got it written down, anyway. And uh, so we had him through Christmas, but uh, we don't have him this Father's Day. He's with the Lord. And uh, I thank the Lord that I had that kind of influence in my life. I thank the Lord that I had an earthly father that loved me and took, went to great extent to uh, take care of me, to make sure, even when, uh, you know, he wasn't a Christian <laughs> all his life, most of his life he wasn't. But he learned morality. He grew up in an early Pentecostal church. Mm -hmm. He learned what morals were, and he lived those morals out in his life. And so when it came to reading the Word of God for me and understanding the Word of God, I didn't have a big problem with it because a lot of it I was already doing. Amen? But I needed salvation, praise God. I needed to be saved. And so that didn't get me anywhere, but at least it gave me a foundation in my life. I'm very grateful to have a, a, a spiritual, uh, spiritual fathers, too. I've had some very fantastic and great spiritual fathers. I have submitted to my spiritual fathers uh, growing up in the, in the church. After I became a young adult in my 20s, I began to listen to fathers that God had put over me in the church. And it was in the church, amen, where I went, walked up an altar one day, uh, not just to receive salvation, but another day 
to receive a call of God on my life. But I want you to understand that the call of God that came upon my life was in the atmosphere of many fathers. Listen, we only had a church of 30 people, but in that church, half of them were male and half of them were fathers. Back then, they were all fathers. They all took care of you. Hallelujah. And God needs to raise that up today. Amen. You can say amen right here. Okay, amen. amen. God needs to raise that up today. And, and, and it was awesome to be raised by those men of God in the beginning. And then going on later in my life, after I became a pastor, I was even mentored by a great man of God, David Wilkerson, who himself was mentored by Leonard Ravenhill, who himself was mentored by Smith Wigglesworth. So the, that, that generational blessing came down the line. And my father even gave me a generational blessing, even before he was a Christian, because he listened to the Word of God. Amen? And so I, in turn, was a blessing. I'm trying to explain something to you. This is the way it works. The way it's, because the reason it's not working so well is we're not doing this anymore. Are you with me? Amen. This is a lost art. Amen? And there are few and far between men of God like this today. And it's incumbent on us. Amen. There's an old hymn in the hymn book. Rise up, O men of God. Rise up, O men of God. Hallelujah. Why are you picking on the men today? It's Father's Day. Rise up, O men of God. Amen. It's the men that are supposed to rise up. Hallelujah. Thank God we've got women to do things. Amen. That's awesome. But you're going to see the attitude of Paul and Timothy and Titus was... You know, if there's a hole somewhere in the body, I'm going to fill it. I could, I could just stop right there and have an altar call. If there's a hole in the body, I'm going to fill it. That was their attitude. I'm not going to go home and pray. I'm not going to go home and seek God about it. I'm not, you know, that's a cover-up a lot of times, church. A lot of times, you know, I can take you to scriptures that tell you to pray about things, and then I can take you to other scriptures that tell you to do it. If you see it, do it. Are you, are, are you hearing me? If you see it, do it. Hallelujah. So this is the kind of breed of fathers that God is raising up, both in the home and in the church. Now I want to go to the book of Philippians, and I want to kind of stay with chapter 2 to illustrate what I'm talking about this morning, the things that God has laid on my heart. And I want you to see today, especially, uh, we are in the, what they call the third wave of feminism. Mm. Amen? The first wave was, was actually pretty cool. Then the second wave got a little out of kilter. And then the third wave is just totally off the wall. Amen? And, explain the first wave. The first wave, you, you explained it, because you explained better than I did. Well, the first wave was just having equal rights to vote right. and to work. Second wave was being given special treatment over men. Third wave is dominating and getting the getting the job instead of a man even having a chance. It's dominating and demonizing men. Right. And getting yeah. special rights and special privileges yeah. and special everything. Yeah. Okay? Just so yeah. This is what we're this is what we're facing today. Amen? <laughs> and I thank the Lord from, from pulpits today that you can hear this, amen, because this is where it should be taught and preached, is in here today, in the churches, amen. amen. Todd? There's some, some radicals who are currently lobbying to have Father's Day removed as yeah. a national holiday. Yeah, there you go. That's how far we've come today, amen. Not only are they knocking down the statues of the Confederates, but they're, uh, you know, they're trying to knock fatherhood completely out of existence, amen. So, uh, I want to read this verse to you before we go to the next slide. It's Philippians 2.13. And if you're a man this morning, I want you to pay special attention to this verse. It is in the Bible, and amen, I'm quoting it in the New King James, alright? And it says this, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. That's a, that is a message to women, but it is a strong message to men. I'm going to show you some men that live this way. That, that God, they let God work in them. They let God, I'm making it very simple, work in them to will and to do His good pleasure. 
I love when politicians stand up and say, I serve at the, at the will of the president. I love that when people say that. And I believe men, especially men of God and fathers and families, need to say that. I serve my family at the will of Jesus Christ. That's how I serve. This has been lost for a long time. Because times are tough. Men have to work a lot. I, I you know, part of me understands that. But the, it's not all about work. Amen? Amen? It's not all about work. Amen. It's about stepping up and taking your role as a man of God. Amen? Are you with me? Amen. Amen. So we, we serve at God's behest, not at the world's behest. Amen? Amen. Now, to give you an example of this, and I don't know if these men are all Christians or whatever, but uh, in Wascom, Texas, City Council unanimously passed an ordinance this week declaring the Texas border town a sanctuary city for the unborn. That was last Tuesday night. A sanctuary city for the unborn. Yeah, thank you, Todd. Amen. Todd saluting them. Seriously. They, these, these are fathers. These are men. This is what men should be doing. They should be looking at this nonsense, folding their arms, and saying, we're going to do something about it. That's right. mm -hmm. We're going to do something about it. You know, you push men so far, you just keep pushing them, and I don't know, they've they got, they got a tipping point now that's way beyond my tipping point because I'm all fired up already, amen? I respect and honor what these men have done. The message that they're sending, amen? This is what fathers do. Whether they're in the church or they're in the in the world. Amen? Alright, so, very simply, number one, some fathers will be like Paul. You'll just take on, I told you, this is, this is generational. This is coming all the way from the apostles. Are you with me? Some will be like Paul, the apostle Paul. And uh, I want you to read Philippians uh, 2.14 with me. It says this, all right? This is what this is this is Paul's attitude. I want you to get his attitude, especially if you're a man here today. He says, "Do all things without." There's certain things that you and I should be doing that should be ab some things should just be absent from what we do, okay? And the first thing he said was, he says, "Do things," and I can see men doing this, okay? "Do things without complaining." And dispute it. Amen? The Bible says that God is at work, we read it, in you to will and to do His good pleasure. Amen? We serve at His pleasure. And so, serving at His pleasure means that we do these things without complaining. Hallelujah. Like, oh yeah, I know i got to do this, so I guess I'll do it. Yeah, i got to go to church this morning. Yeah, i got to... Oh, man, I ain't going to teach no Sunday school. No way. No way am I going to sac sacrifice myself to those little kids. I'm not going to do that. You know, and, and we, we, boy, oh boy, we get that attitude. I'm just too busy. I'm just too, you know, oh, well, all right, I guess I better do it because Pastor Ed preached on it. Okay, here we go. No, that's complaining. See, in, in the parentheses, it's secret displeasure. Secret. They, they call that in psychology passive aggressive. <laughs> Amen? Passive aggressive. How many folks do stuff in the church, but they do it passive aggressively? Why, why can't we just do it like we just do it? Amen? Mikey knew that that was right. Just do it. Amen? <laughs> and, and without disputing, without internal debate, where, you know, a lot of people do this, you know, they do stuff. But then they have this debate inside. I don't know if I should be doing this. All these things go on. He says, do me, do me a favor. This is what I do in my life. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, just do it without complaining. Do it without disputing. Verse 15, that you may become blameless and harmless. Blameless and harmless means no defect in you, no mixture. How many of you just want to walk around the rest of your days with a defect? 
Amen? We gotta start, we gotta start teaching people. Amen. We've got to start teaching young people especially that they, they need to get free of their sin, free of their stuff. Amen. No defects, no mixture. He says, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Last week I preached the message where Peter stood up, said the same thing in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. He says, save yourselves from this crooked and perverse generation. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, our generation is crooked and perverse. And our kids are following along under that generational curse of going along with that. And beloved, listen, we need leaders. We need people to stand up and say, I'm not going to let anybody go that way. I'm not going to let anybody go in that direction. Amen? Among whom you shine as lights in the world. These are good verses, aren't they? Holding fast to the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Now, I don't know how you think leaders should feel, but this is the way leaders feel a lot of times. A lot of times we go before the Lord and pray and say, Lord, look, I, I don't want to do this in vain. I really don't. I want to see people grow. I want to see people just not say this is, oh yeah, this is God's word, this is nice, this is wonderful. But really, really get into the word of God and understand, like he said, holding up the word of life. So that I may rejoice one day that I didn't work in vain. Amen? Oh, I know, you know, I know when I preach the word of God, it touches people and things like that. But there has to be more than just a change. Amen? Or a, a touch, I should say. There has to be a change. Are you with me? So, many of us today have this idea. Is it for me? No, it's Washington. Well, it's Washington. Okay, all right. Say hi to uh, hi Donald, President Trump. How are you? Okay, so I want to ask a question. I, I don't want you to raise your hand, okay? Because it could be embarrassing. Okay, so don't raise, this is one of those I'm just going to ask. Don't, don't raise your hand. How many of us intentionally come up short? How many of us? I work hard. I, 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 I'm a busy man. We come up, we intentionally come up short. We got all this power of God behind us, all the authority of God behind us, all we've got so much of heaven behind us, and we just we think we can walk through life and intentionally come up short. All I can say is my my my. <laughs> I I I understand that, that this isn't God's desire. Praise God, Amen. So Paul's got this attitude going, Amen. As a father, right now. Here's another principle he understood, all right? Let me go back and remind myself, all right? They're going, to, they're going to do all things without certain things, amen? So here's the idea, that they would empty themselves. A lot of, if you want to look at a father, a true father, you will find a person that is empty. He's emptied himself of himself, and he's taken on something divine, something different, something otherworldly that he's done. That is a, that's a true father. A true father is a man who will work three jobs if he has to, to support his family and not neglect them. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. He'll do it somehow. Amen? Amen? And he'll do that with his spiritual family. He'll work, he'll work, he'll work, but he will still take his place. Take your place at the city gate. This is like taking your place at the city gate. He will still be there. Praise God. Verse 17. Watch what Paul says. This is that pouring out principle. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. So where do you get this, this drink offering thing from? You know, I'm being... My life is being poured out as a drink offering. Is he, is he being Shakespearean? 
You know, is he being, you know, is he being dramatic? Is he being Broadway? Or is this actually really what he's doing? He's really being poured out like a drink offering. If you don't understand the principle of the drink offering, you have to read 1 Corinthians 11. It says this, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. <laughs> We've lost this, man. We've lost this. We always like to leave a little in the cup for ourselves. And Jesus says, This cup is my life, and this cup is your life. And today it is getting poured out. And everybody that follows me gets poured out too. That's what that says. So those of you who don't understand communion quite well, that's what that means. That cup poured out was Jesus Christ. And it's incumbent upon every man and every woman of God to pour out themselves. Amen. And let God will and do in your life what he desires. You serve at his behest. We need fathers. We need fathers, not just one, not just two, but many, several, that communicate this to the church. Amen? And watch over this very, very strongly. But no, we sometimes we just want to leave a little in a cup for ourselves. A little in a cup to play around with. Amen? Listen, men of God need to rise up. I want to read this to you. This is uh, Philippians 2.5. It's right in this chapter. And this is where I believe Paul learned to pour out. It says this, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the very form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. There's the pouring out right there. No reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant. There it is again. Coming in the likeness of men. There it is again. Pouring himself out. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. He's talking about the Father and he's talking about fathers and he's talking about men of God here. Glory to his name. He's saying that to be a true man, you're not full of yourself. You're empty of everything that you are. And you're full of God. And you're full of the ways and purposes of God. And God could, to, could take you and move you, just like he could with Paul, to move him from, from uh, Asia over to Macedonia. Just like that. Just like that. And how many of us could say, if God said to us this very minute, I want you to go, I want you to go to the, the lowest part of Mexico, I want you to go down to the Guatemala border, and I want you to preach the gospel, how many of you would say, I can do that? Men of God can, regardless of the circumstances and regardless of the consequences. God wants it, I'll do it. Hallelujah. I don't know why I thought of that border down there, but I did. All right? Probably because it's in the news a lot. Okay. All right. So we, we understand this is the attitude of Paul. Now, some men can be like that. Some men can be like Timothy. Hallelujah. I love Timothy. He was a good guy. He was a, Timothy was not, you know, he was not a formal apostle. Paul was an apostle. Timothy was an apostle to the church. A little different. Paul was an apostle over churches. Timothy was an apostle to churches. Amen? And I want to tell you something. A church can have hundreds of these. I said the church can have hundreds of these. Amen. I, I move in an apostolic anointing. You can move. As a man of God, you can move in an apostolic anointing. What does that mean? That means you're a father. That's all it means. You're a dad to your church. You're the kids come to you. Or you see something, that can, or you're interested in the kids and the children, or you're interested, the women are hurting, so you're interested in helping them out. See, that's what this is all about. Amen? And some are going to be just like the, uh, Timothy, the apostle to his church, the Philippian church. Now I want you to understand there's a principle that Timothy brings out. This is Philippians 2.19. It's mutual encouragement. Paul talks about Timothy, and he talks about him this way. He says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus, to send Timothy to you shortly. That's amazing that Paul 
had a guy that he could send somewhere. What would you do if I said, you know, I really feel like you need to go to, you know, Guatemala? You'd say, hey, Jack, you support my family first, and then I'll go to Guatemala. Look at this. Amen? Sorry to sound like I'm from New Jersey, but look at this. He just sends him. Timothy, you go there. Not Timothy, I'll pay for you to go there. Timothy, I'll, I'll take you. Yeah, nothing. He says, that I may be encouraged when I know your state. Mutual encouragement. Amen? It, how many people in the church, the leadership of the church, knows very little about your life? And most people's attitude is, well, you've got to find out. You've got to find out. No, we don't have to find out. No, we don't. We don't have to sit at your table every night and eat your food. <laughs> Are you with me? Okay. You bring that out. And so, you know, he sent in Timothy there to, to understand the struggles that they're going through because a father wants to know. He just wants to know. Okay? He's not going to peek in your window and try to find out. He just wants to know. Verse 20, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. Isn't that sad? He at least had one that would go and care for somebody else. Verse 21, it even gets worse here. For all seek their own and not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Boy, that's an accurate description of today. I've got enough of my own stuff not to worry about the kingdom of God. Wow. See, I, it's, it's the lack of fatherhood. Fatherhood would foster this into the hearts of people. Amen? It's not one lonely voice in the wilderness. It's men of God understanding their role as fathers and beginning to set up a foundation in an atmosphere in the church. And I'm talking about churches all over the world. Amen? where you know, a, a man of God or a leader could call on them at the drop of a hat and see them just absolutely minister in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So th this principle of mutual encouragement, and then Timothy brings proven character. Watch this. But you know his proven character, that as his son with his father, he served me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall come to you shortly. Uh, again, he, you know, he's, he's in jail. He's in prison. He, he's, he, he should be worried about himself. And he's still he's sending Timothy because he's not worried about himself. not worried about Timothy. He's worried about the Philippians. Amen? He's worried about their hurting. Oh, and it, it, it even gets... The, the, I'm not going to call it worry, but his concern goes even deeper than this. Amen? And um, so, but I want you to see that they were like-minded, like father, like son. How many of you have heard that description? Like father, like son. Usually it's used in a derogatory sense. Amen? You're a hard head like your father, you know? At least they used to say that in New Jersey. I don't know if they say that here. In Wyoming, they may have another term for it. But anyway, uh, this man had proven character. They were like father and like son, and that was important. Amen? And the last one I want to show you is Epaphroditus, because this man is, is a jewel, an absolute jewel. So we have some like Paul. God wants to raise up some like Timothy. Amen? And God wants to raise up some like Epaphroditus. Now let's read verse 25. It says, yet I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need since he was longing for all of you and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. Now, I want you to get this is like a ping pong match. All right? This is like a ping pong match. I'm going to show you. All right? So Epaphroditus was in Philippi. And then Philippi sent Epaphrodites to Paul. And then Paul was in jail, administering, uh, or 
Epaphroditus was ministering to the Apostle Paul and got sick. And then Paul wants to send him back, not because he's sick. But then the, the Philippian church is upset. Uh, it, it's just, it's crazy. They're upset because Epaphroditus is sick. But then Epaphroditus is upset because the Philippians are upset because he's sick. <laughs> All that from two verses? You want, how many of you want me to repeat that? No. No. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So, <laughs> where do you find people like this? Amen? Men of God who are, are sad because they got real sick, and you're sad that they're sick, and they're sad that you're sad. I'm, I'm not being funny. I'm really not, but... You get what I'm saying? Where God can raise these men up. God, I, and, and women, I want you to look at every man like they have this potential. Seriously. that's I'm trying to create an awakening here. Women need to look at the men this way. You, you need to make them squirm. <laughs> Come on. This is the way every man should be looked at this way. This is what we should be doing. Amen? This is the kind of heart we should have. Glory to God. Verse 27, For indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. This, this, is some, this is what a man carries, beloved. Let me tell you something. A man, a true man, a true man of God, will carry sorrow upon sorrow in his heart. But he will not be overtaken by it. He will not be overtaken by it. But he will look at it. You know, a lot of times women think men aren't sensitive. <laughs> I see. <laughs> I see people looking at each other. <laughs> Seriously. All right? Maybe, maybe I need to help the guys out here today. Okay? Women think men are not sensitive. They are. They're just sensitive about different things. Whew. Amen? They're sensitive about different things. And if you or married, a married woman, married to a man, or even dating a man, or something like that, I want to tell you something. You just need to realize that there are sensitivities in his life that you know nothing about. Nothing. <laughs> and it's time that you understand and encourage them to go after. You encourage them to explore and to go out and conquer the things that they're very sensitive about. Amen? There are things this week that have moved me to tears that are going on in the world. Amen? I cried about my dad being gone. Yes, I did. I'm, you know, because we were so very close and I'm preaching a message today on Father's Day. And, and I just, I cried over that slide, that, that abortion issue and the things that are going on in this world. Amen? That, that as a man, I have a sensitivity towards. I can't stand to see some of the things that go on in this world. I can't stand to see them uh, the, the way so many things are going on. But, and I'm sensitive to it. Men can be that way. And women, you need to encourage them to do that. Amen? They might not like the colors that you like. They might not like the china that you like. But let them be men. There was a slide up there that said something about the grass. The mother yells that you're trampling the grass. And, and, and the man is like, I'm not here to grow grass. I'm here to grow a kid. <laughs> Things that men are very serious, uh, sensitive about. Amen? Hallelujah. Amen. So we, we carry sorrow upon sorrow. But that's to produce a, a, an effect. Amen? An effect. I, I often think about what that uh, feminist said about men, that, you know, they'll just take it for so long, and then they go into uh, uh, 
Toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity, yeah. Which is actually, they call it toxic masculinity, but it's a good thing. Because it just they just go in, they become barbarians, and they wipe out all the darkness. And it's done. And it's over with. Amen? And, so, and that's going to happen. Praise God. Amen? I'm not, a ter I'm not practicing terrorism. I'm just telling you something. Okay? Well, the cultures decay when women rule. Yeah. And they do. Yeah. Historically. And we love women. And we're good. But they, they're just not meant to rule. Not meant to rule. Amen? They're meant to do a lot of things, but not meant for that. Okay? And verse 29. Okay? We're just about at the end here. You guys okay? You still together? Having a good time? Okay, good. All right. Todd and Lois, you guys still together back there? Awesome. Ed and Susan, are you, are you guys all right? All right, so well, last point here, okay? And, and, and I hope this is helpful to you, amen, these characteristics. Uh, verse 29, uh, supply what is lacking. Well, let's just read this. Receive him, therefore, him meaning Epaphrodites, Say, say that so you at least get it, you, you know how to say it. Epaphroditus, okay? Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem. Amen? That is a message to the church today. That the, that the church, especially women and children in the church, should be looking for these kind of men. They should be praying for it. Be praying that they get raised up, and we hold these men in esteem. Verse 30, because for the work of Christ, he came, Epaphroditus, came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service towards me. There's another, there's another ping pong match going on here. I just explain it that way so you understand. It's very complicated. Uh, this is the Apostle Paul talking. All right? And he's speaking to the Philippian church. And he's saying, I'm going to send Epaphrodites to you uh, because you, church, were the ones that were sensitive to me. You were the ones that sent me funds. And if you read Philippians, you'll see that they sent Paul. They were the only church, this first European church, they were the only church to support Paul. And he says, you, you were the guys that supported me and he said, uh, you, you sent me Epaphrodites, a, a he said, even, which was above and beyond the call of duty. You know, I, I could have just received the support. I could have just sat alone in my jail cell in Rome and taken care of myself. But you went above and beyond, and you sent this man of God to me to supply what was lacking in your service. So, I want you to see the dynamic that's going on here, beloved. These people are going far beyond, far beyond what their, you know, what normal requirements are. Amen? They're going far beyond it. Not because they want to please Paul, not because they want to please Timothy, not because they want to please anybody. They just want to please God. That's why they're doing it. Not so they'll get a, a glorified position in the church or a, you know, a, a television program or whatever. They're not doing it for that reason. They're, they're, but they're going above and beyond to supply what is lacking. And, and here's my question and my final question to you today. Is there a hole somewhere that you can see? Is there a hole you're a part of this church. Is there a hole here somewhere? Is there a gaping hole here somewhere? Because I can, I could have listed them on the board. I could have gave, uh, given you a lot of gaping holes that there are here. But is there a hole? And if there is, why not fill it? Why not fill it? Well, I, I got to work around the clock. I didn't, no. That wouldn't float with Timothy. That wouldn't float with Epaphrodites. That wouldn't have float with Paul. If you see a hole, you fill it. That's all there is to it. There's some people here, maybe you're just called to, to pray. 
Amen? You just call to pray. Or you, you know that prayer, you, maybe you can't do what you used to be able to do, but you can pray. Amen? And we fill that hole that's somewhere. Amen? That, that somewhere in the church. Somewhere. And God is raising up men of God to see those holes. What did I remember a scripture in the Old Testament. Uh, Daniel uh, talked about, uh, was it Daniel? Filling up the gap, filling up the hole in the wall. Well, who was oh, it? Nehemiah. Who was it? Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Nehemiah filled, well, he, he literally filled up holes yeah. in the wall. But then there was another prophet that said, you know, uh, stand in the gap. Come on, who is that? I can't remember. Anyway, stand in the gap. And that's, that's what we're called to do. We're called to look at a hole, see the hole, and say, I'll fill it. That's it. Amazing. Without people coming up to you, without doing a spiritual gift survey, without, you know, all, all kinds of things. Just, that's fatherhood in the church. That's apostleship in the church. It comes upon men, and it does come upon women too. And that's okay. Amen? Because we flow in the, in the flow that the Lord wants us to flow in. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today. We're aware of the word, uh, the uh, hymn book says, Rise up, O men of God. And Lord, I thank you, Father God, that there's a, a, a true task before us today. Lord Jesus, we're not, we're not putting a list up and saying, here's what you can do, here's what you can do. But Lord, truly in the spirit of this message today, You've given us eyes to see. Eyes to see where the holes are. Eyes to see where the holes are in our young people, in our children. Eyes to see where it is in the adults, where they need help, where they need encouragement, where they need so much, Lord. And Father, we can be about that. I thank you and I praise you this morning. Lord, even as we were leaving the, the garage this morning, Susan and I, we both got the word. We saw our neighbors next door that just moved in next door. What a hole we could fill by like just helping them out and inviting them to church. And so, Father, we're just praying that we'll move in this new anointing, this new fatherhood that you're raising up, a new breed of, of men, of men of God and women of God that do the same, basically the same thing. They just, they're at your serving at your behest and not at their own. Lord, we just thank you and praise you this day and raise up the fathers, raise up the men of God in this congregation. Lord, we thank you and I ask Holy Spirit that you would come down and seal this right now. I'm not going to give an altar call today. I'm just going to ask you to seal it, Holy Spirit, in the hearts of men and women today. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. And amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.